Bull Mellies? Yes. Uh-oh. Well, while Doc is working on that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell a little Vegas story. I figure we're in Vegas, let's talk Vegas stories. There's some that I can't tell, but um, this one I can. So, you know, being I'm getting a little older, I decided that I should probably, sorry, that, um, start being more refined in my alcohol. So I thought, okay, I think I'm gonna start looking into whiskey. I see Doc posting all these things with his whiskey, you know, all this nice fine whiskey drinks. I'm like, you know, I gotta be more refined. I gotta start looking into whiskey. So I decided, you know, I don't really know much about it. And this is about six years ago. So I started looking into whiskey, and I'm like, you know, I, do I like scotch? Do I like the bourbon? You know, to, you know, there's a lot to learn about whiskey once you start looking into it. So one night in Vegas, about six week, six years ago, I'm out with my sister who's down here and, and her casino host, and we had a nice dinner and some wine. And we go back to the bar at the Mirage, and we're having, you know, we're gonna have one last cocktail, and I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna get a really good whiskey. You know, I'm feeling pretty good, I'm gonna get a really good whiskey. And I figure that, you know, maybe a hundred bucks or something like that. I got a hundred burning the pot, you know, hold my pocket, so. So I go to the bartender, I said, hey, give me a good whiskey. He's like, well, what do you think? And I'm like, I don't know, you know, there's a whole plethora of them out there. And I'm like, well, what are those up there? And then he's like, oh, those are McCallans. I'm like, oh, I think I've heard of that, it's supposed to be pretty good. And I said, you go, well, how about one of those? He goes, well, do you want the 5, the 10, or the 25? And I'm like, well, I, I think older is better, so the 25, of course, right? <laughs> so I go to the 25, and he goes, just say, no, that's expensive. And to me, I thought, oh, expensive, you know, 100 bucks, you know, maybe 80 bucks, you know, that's fine. So I order it, and, you know, and of course, you know, being a rookie, I order a Bud Light with it, too, so I can chase it, you know. <laughs> so I have this Bud Light, I'm down the dance floor, I think I spilled half of this half a shot I got of this 25 year gallon. And uh, I, uh, I, you know, start drinking it, and the next thing I hear, uh, my sister at the bar, Joe, what the hell is wrong with you? I'm like, what? What? what I do now? You know, she's been yelling at me for years. She goes, you bought a $650 shot of whiskey? I'm like, my jaw dropped. I'm like, what? I did? I'm like, no. So I went up there and I went to the bartender and said, what? He goes, yeah, I told you it was expensive. And I said, well, $100 is expensive. This is $650. Are you kidding me? You didn't tell me this? He goes, well, I didn't want to offend you. And I said, well, you're offending me now because I have 650 bucks. And so the host usually will write it off and spill it to my sister's room. And so she's pissed at me. And so we went through this whole ordeal. And the guy's like, well, I'll talk to my manager. We're probably going to be able to get it written off. And okay, cool. So I got this hundred bucks still. So I like, tipped the guy a hundred bucks and said, hey, man, that's cool. Sorry, my fault. I think it's your fault a little bit too, but I should have you know, known. Here's a hundred bucks. He's like, oh, cool. Well, two lessons. One, don't I always believe a bartender because the $650 still went on the room. So now it's $750 shot. And two, your idea of expensive and someone else's idea of expensive uh, in Vegas is definitely different. That's my whiskey experience. That's a good whiskey. No whiskey. And I blame Doc. Yeah. <laughs> Send the bill to Doc. Yeah, not bad. So, so, and I remember what it tastes like. I think it was good. At least right, right now. now. Okay, just started. So, today we're going to talk about uh, clinical application of platelet uh, rich plasma injections. So, uh, first off, just show of hands who's doing platelet rich plasma injections in their office? Oh, good. Quite a few. Great. So, um, and results good in general? Everybody's having good results with them? Yeah, great, a couple thumbs up. So yeah, I, I started this probably about 10 years ago and really took an interest in it and you know, was fascinated by the fact that we can use our own blood to repair our own tissue. And so for these recalcitrant heel pains, the Achilles tendinosis, all these issues that you know, we've tried all the conservative treatments, we've done orthotics, we've done cortisone injections, we've done casting, we've done this, we've done physical therapy. The next step was we usually would take the surgery, but this is a good aggressive alternative, I think, before surgery. And so it's a good alternative for patients that don't want to go to that surgical inter intervention. You know, don't get me wrong, like an endoscopic plantar fasciotomy is, I think, great for plantar fasciitis, but I've literally done one of those in the last 10 years since I've been doing these PRP injections. So I think it's a great uh, adjunct procedure that we all should be thinking about. Again, you're not burning the bridges, you're using your patient's own blood. All right. So today we're going to uh, learn about uh, what is PRP and how does it work, how to prepare that PRP in your office, uh, what, it, what is it used for, what do I use it for in the podiatric settings, 
Uh, what are the pro my protocols for PRP injection? Uh, some of the results that I, uh, through the literature that I've found, and also some of the results that I, I've done. We're also going to talk a little bit about um, PRP and joints and BMAC, because I usually get a question about that, so we're just going to get that in the butt and talk about that as well, because uh, that's kind of the new up and coming thing. So we'll chat about that a bit too. Uh, so I have no disclosures. Um, so first off, what is platelet, platelet rich plasma? It's bioactive component of the whole blood with platelet concentrations well above the baseline, containing high levels of various growth factors that are released by the platelets for healing. So what does it do in, in, in a cellular level? What is it doing in the body? Um, the growth factors, when they're released, they're creating cell proliferation, chemotaxis, cell differentiation, and angiogenesis. Uh, what is it doing to the injured tissue and the scar tissue that, that we are trying to uh, help prevent? Uh, it modulates collagen synthesis, it causes tissue healing, and it releases cytokines, which help with the inflammatory process and decreasing the pain. Um, it also is a chemo attractant. So why do we get pain relief this? How does it work on, like a, on a, a patient level? So early pain relief is usually because the platelets are releasing these cytokines. And when they release the cytokines, it inhibits the COX-2 enzyme that's causing the inflammation. And that's where patients get this early pain relief. But more, it, more so, what's probably more important is the long-term relief that they get with it. And that's because of the cellular proliferation, the neoangiogenesis, bringing in new cells and, and allowing uh, healing of the tissue, and it, the increased type 1 collagen proliferation. So that's all fine then, you guys get all that, right? You understand that. But when you're trying to explain that to a patient, you start throwing out cell proliferation, <coughs> there's gonna be a lot. So, so how do I pr pr propose this to the patient? I basically tell them, listen, we've done all this conservative care for your plantar fascia or your Achilles or whatever, and none of it's working. Your body's in what's called this quiescent phase. It's not getting better, it's not getting worse, it's just sitting there. And so we need to reinitiate that healing cascade we got to create more trauma and then give it a super concentration of these platelets and start that inflammatory process and then go into the reparative process and do the regeneration phase of healing. And I explained how you know, anytime you cut yourself, you get inflammation, you get coagulation, those are the platelets that you're getting. And once that happens, then you start this inflammatory process and then it starts the healing cascade. I also explained that not only are we put this super concentration of platelets in there, we're also creating trauma by dry needling to a certain extent. So we're creating trauma so the platelets will aggregate in the first place anyways because we're creating the trauma with the needle so it's twofold. When I say that, they understand and then, you know, they're like, well, let's proceed. That sounds great. The, uh, so not all PRP units are, are created equally. So, you know, there's a ton of different centrifuges out there. Um, I've used several of them and I had, you know, we'll go through some of the advantages and disadvantages of these because we have to be able to make sure you know what kind of blood you're getting. Um, you just can't use a typical centrifuge and, you know, in a test tube and expect to get your PRP. You have to have a certain kit and you have to pay for a kit in your office to be able to get this. Uh, so Arthrex makes this uh, autologous condition plasma centrifuge or ACP centrifuge. Um, so it's autologous condition plasma, which I think is a fancy way of saying platelet poor plasma. So it's, it's not that it's poor in plasma or platelets, it's actually higher than the baseline, but it's not as high as the platelet rich plasma. They have a double barrel syringe, um, you can separate the platelet poor plasma from the whole blood and the red blood cells, you can see on the picture on the right there. Um, um, you can cheat a little bit with it and try to get what's called a buffy layer, which is a layer between the platelet poor and the red blood cells, and try to get a little bit of that, because that's where the platelet rich plasma um, but it's a little bit of a guesswork trying to pull out some of that blood without getting the red blood cells. Uh, the, one of the advantages of it is it's a short spin time. It's five, uh, five minutes to spin and only 15 cc's of blood from the, the, from the patient. They also make an angel system, which is this uh, 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 pretty complex system that you're able to dial in the hematocrit, which will then determine how much white blood cells you get with. Uh, with your platelet-rich plasma, which is important when you're repairing uh, cartilage in a joint, which in my next lecture I'll talk a little bit more about that, but also important um, if, if you want more white blood cells for the inflammatory process. So the other advantage of this is used in an OR setting mostly um, is you can use BMAC, so bone marrow aspirate concentrates so and get some stem cells and it'll separate the stem cells and the platelets so you can inject that into the injured tissue or the joint if you're doing a joint. 
Uh, there's another one called Magellan. I personally haven't used this, but I've heard good things about it, read about it. Um, again, it's one of those more fancy ones that you can use in the, in the surgical setting uh, where you can use VMAC and whole blood to separate the platelets and the stem cells. Um, you can also dial in the amount of leukocytes, so the white blood cells, whether you want a leukocyte rich PRP or leukocyte poor. There's a study out there uh, by Rival et al., uh, which shows the effects of leukocyte concentration on PRP and knee osteoarthritis. So they looked at all these different uh, types of um, uh, uh, PRP injections and whether leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor was better for the joints when you're trying to decrease inflammation in the, in the knee joint. And what they found that leukocyte poor was much better uh, because it decreased, it caused less inflammation because the white blood cells will increase the inflammatory response, which is great for soft tissues, but bad for joints. And so you have to know what, what kind of platelet-rich plasma you're getting, so that's very important. So again, leukocyte rich, great for soft tissues. We want the inflammatory process. Leukocyte poor, better for joints um, because we want to decrease the inflammatory response in the joint. So the one I've been using mostly lately is by Zimmer Biomed. Um, this one has, I, I like this one because it has uh, a syringe or a uh, vial that has three compartments. And so it separates the platelet poor plasma, the platelet rich plasma, and the whole blood and red blood cells. So there's no guesswork. We're not trying to get that buffy coat. Um, I use 27 cc's of blood um, and 3 cc's of an ACD or uh, uh, anticoagulant basically because you don't want to coagulate when you're spinning. It does take a little bit longer to spin but you have plenty, plenty of time in your office to go see another patient or you can start injecting the patient while you're waiting for it to spin. So in the office, it makes sense for the ACP unit, Zimmer Biomed unit. Um, if you want to do like BMAC in your office, I'm not sure, are you guys doing BMAC in the office? <coughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, I really wanted to start doing that. It's a little, you know, we can't obviously go to the tibial, uh, go up there, but I, I've done it the tibial crest of the OR setting, I've uh, done the calcaneus, but I think it makes sense to, if we can get these stem cells as well, especially if you're injecting joints to maybe do that in the office as well. But you're going to need the angel or the Magellan system to be able to separate all the stem cells as well. So, just like anything you read, you know, like I tell my kids, you know, don't believe everything on the internet, don't believe everything you read. You have to use some critical thinking. So like this guy with the toothpaste, you know, just because it says squeeze from the bottom doesn't mean really squeeze from the bottom. Um, so when I'm looking at the literature, there's several people, or some articles out there where people are injecting this PRP over and over again. So there's a lot of questions whether do you inject once, do you inject twice, three times. And so one of the articles that I have in here is they injected three times, uh, two weeks apart. To me, that doesn't make sense. If we're trying to initiate this healing cascade and get into the inflammatory and then to the reparative phase, why are we injecting two weeks later? Because we're just going to reinitiate that inflammatory response again. So we're just going to, we're kind of spinning our wheels. So to me, I've always just said one injection, I thought it's fine. I think it's probably a financial thing, to be honest with you, because you make more money. Um, so one of my other protocols is, is, and I think makes sense, is that you uh, don't want them to be taking any anti-inflammatories during the inflammatory phase. So I have them stop taking anti-inflammatories a week prior to get it out of their system, and the week afterwards, so they can get through that inflammatory phase. So no aspirin, no NSAIDs, um, you know, anything that's going to uh, impede the inflammatory process. So what do we do? I take 27 cc's of blood out of their out of their arm, uh, 15 cc's if I'm using the ACP. We then transfer that over the vial for the centrifuge. Uh, while that's spinning, I'll mark out the point of maximal tenderness, and I'll mark out a little grid. And so you can see on the bottom of the heel here. I have probably you know, 10, 15 you know, spots of the point of active the tennis maybe here, and then I go around it. Um, you want to do this before you anesthetize the patient because mm -hmm. obviously they won't be able to feel it. So make sure you find out where it hurts the most and then mark it out, and then you can inject it. Now, in the early on, in the 10, years, uh, 10 years ago, they were saying, you know, maybe you should inject it, maybe you should, you should just do this, you might dilute it, maybe you do this without, you know, without anesthetizing the patient. Well, there's a guy here today in this in this room who could test that that's a really, really bad idea. Because we decided that he had a chronic ATF, you know, sprain, and we decided let's do a you know an injection of this PRP as if 